na Bwana nguvu zako zinazidi kututawala na kututenda mema. Mungu inuliwe na usifiwe kwa sababu ya utukufu wako. Twatubu kila dhambi mbele zako asubuhi ya leo ili Bwana uzidi kututakaza kutukumbali hata kutembea pamoja nasi katika shughuli za leo. Bwana tunakushukuru maana umepelekana pamoja nasi wiki mzima. Na zaidi ya hayo Bwana unazidi kuitwa malaki na unazidi kuitwa Mungu katika njambo lote. Ndipo sasa Mungu tunajiachilia kwako tukiomba uzidi kuwa pamoja nasi mchana huu wote na kwa kila njambo Bwana tukapate kuona ushindi wako. Tubariki tutende mema Kumbuka Bwana tuko mbele zako tunaomba uso wako kazidi kupelekana pamoja nasi. Kuwa pamoja nasi tusaidie ukatubariki na ni kwako Yesu Kristo mokosi wetu tumeomba na hata kushukuru. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We can take our seats and as we appreciate our choir. Tutajua ni choir ya kutoka wapi tutakapokuwa tunaendelea na nichukue nafasi kuwakaribisha katika Bible study ya hasubi ya leo ambayo ni ya mwisho na tushukuru Mungu ya kwamba ametuwezesha tukakuja mapema na kwa hivyo tutakuwa na nafasi nzuri ya kuweza kusikia Bwana anasema na nini nasi katika siku hii ya mwisho na katika uh, tamaduni za ushirika uh, tukimaliza kupata the Bible study then we can have maybe two responses one from our ministers one from our elders uh, from our engagement and our thoughts about engagement of the youth in our church. Therefore, I want to take this opportunity to welcome once again our speaker, Dr. Kevin Morithi, who has been very instrumental in this General Assembly. Please take the podium and take us through the Bible study. Karibu sana. Makofi kwake. Good morning and praise the Lord. Bwana Yesu apewe sifa. Moderator Sai was hoping that one of the resolutions uh, that would have come out yesterday was that uh, this GA uh, urges the assembly to stay for one more day. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> today is our last day, uh, but will be a first will usher us into the first day of our service uh, for the next three years. Uh, I am grateful that uh, you have been an encouraging congregation, both those here and those online from the comments I've been receiving. And uh, today we conclude our three days together. We began by asking ourselves, who are we really serving? And yesterday we asked ourselves, who are we serving with? And finally, brothers and sisters, today we look at the so what question, how will we serve? As we have been doing the last uh, two days, the reading comes from the book of Joshua chapter 24, verse 14 and 15. The word of God says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let us pray. Baba Mokozi wetu tunakupa sifa Asubuhi njema ya leo, tukikushukuru kwa fadhili zako na neema zako ambazo ni za milele. Tunaomba kwamba utasemezana na sisi, utatuonyesha njia inayofaa. Tufunze kuhusu huduma na utumishi kwa vile umetuita kuhudumu sisi na familia zetu. And Lord, would you take center stage to teach us? May I decrease that you may increase and that all glory, honor, and adoration would return to you and you alone. In Jesus' name, we pray. I observed that in his GA report, the moderator said that in our focus on structure, we must not lose sight of the people 
that we serve. Ministry, after all, can be defined as various services inspired by the Spirit of God in accordance to the Word of God to meet the needs of the people of God. The various services inspired by the Spirit of God in accordance to the Word of God to meet the needs of the people of God, but also to meet the needs, of course, of the world around us, the society. An elementary function of the church is to meet the needs of the society. As some have said, the church is not a museum of saints, but a hospital for sinners. The church, the ecclesia, is the gathered people of God. Uh, we find that in the New Testament, but of course the New Testament is always connected to the Old Testament. And the church in the New Testament is connected to the people of God, to this Jewish community here in the Old Testament that we have been looking at in the book of Joshua in chapter 24. This community of God's people, we have been saying that God had called Abraham to be a blessing to the nations. And so the church must be a blessing to the nations. The church must be a blessing to the society. The church must serve the society, of course, as we live out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today, I want us to focus on, of course, verse 15 has been our, is, our, is our theme, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But I think Joshua gives us the how in verse 14 when he says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Verse 14, therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. We have an easy answer. How should we serve the Lord? In sincerity and in faithfulness. But brothers and sisters, allow me to offer to you this morning three principles of service that can guide us as we look forward to the next three years. The first, Joshua talks of, number one, the motivation for our service. The motivation for our service. Fear the Lord and then serve him in sincerity and, faith, uh, and faithfulness. Fear the Lord. Again, this is reminding us of the first day's sermon or question, who are we really serving? But what is the motivation for our service as the people of God? The fear of the Lord, as the book of Proverbs says, is the beginning of knowledge. Now, I would think of knowledge in two ways, that there is what I would call primary or foundational knowledge. This is the knowledge of God, the knowledge of God, without which all other knowledges, all other master's degrees and PhD degrees would be nothing if people do not have a knowledge of God, a proper knowledge of God, primary or foundational knowledge, but also secondary or what I would refer to as practical knowledge or even wisdom, that is knowledge of self, knowledge of others, and knowledge of our environment, our ministry environment, our ministry season. In what season are we currently serving in? That kind of knowledge would be coming from the knowledge that we have of God. And that is also Joshua. Time and again, he would consult the word of God. He would consult the, the wisdom of God to guide him as to how he was to do the how of ministry. And so when he goes to those walls in Jericho, he hears the word of God. It is the knowledge of God that gives him practical insight into the things of his ministry. So the fear of God as the motivation for service, when we fear the wrong thing, we are stagnant, we are incapacitated. Hatuwezi kusonga, hatuwezi kuchukua, hatuwa za imani. Tunapoteza nafasi ya kuona mungu huyu wetu, mungu mkuu, akitutendea mambo ya ajabu, akitusaidia katika changamoto za huduma. We cannot move. If we fear the wrong things, we cannot take steps of faith, we lose out on God's miraculous interventions. We are poorer in our spiritual transformation when we fear the wrong thing. Look, look at the life of Joshua. Think if Joshua feared men or human beings more than he feared God, he would be dwarfed by the giants in Canaan during the spy visit in Numbers 13, isn't it? If Joshua feared his circumstances 
more than he feared God, he would have lost his calling, his commissioning, and his courageous adventures with God. Numbers 27. If Joshua feared the walls more than he feared God, Jericho would still be standing as tall as his fears. Joshua 6. When we look too deeply into our fears and failures without looking ever more deeply into God, we lose our compass of service. Fear the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the proper motivation for, for service. So fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. But number two, we find in this passage the model of our service. So the motivation for our service, the model of our service. How should we serve in sincerity and in faithfulness? What I find interesting, according to the word of God this morning, is that the way Joshua describes the how of ministry is not based on the KPIs we so often associate with the work of God. The way Joshua de defines successful ministry or how we are to go about ministry, he focuses more on quality rather than quantity. Fear him in sincerity and in faithfulness. And I was asking myself, what would be the KPIs of serving in sincerity and faithfulness? There is an emphasis here not to throw away the quantities or the KPIs of ministry, but to really get at the heart of it, the quality of ministry. That as we focus on the externals, God is inviting us to focus on the internal. As we focus on external growth, we are thinking for our congregations, the internal growth, the internal makeup, the, the increase in gr spiritual growth, the, the depth of prayers, the, the depth of understanding of the word of God, that we are focusing on both the externals, but also the, the internals. We heard from the first day that temptation of the rival gods. The God of Mammon continues to tempt us to focus more on the externals, but our living God would have us walk a different path as the church of God. We have two examples in the New Testament that show us the wrong models of ministry or the, uh, the, the, the wrong uh, models of ministry. The first I find in the book of 1 Corinthians, you have this great two men of God, Paul and Apollos, and the community of Christians in Corinth, and they were debating and arguing. I think Paul, when he preaches, I usually want to come to the congregation at, before the church starts. I can't wait. But you know, Apollos, when he preaches is when I, I feel I have that peace that surpasses all human understanding, and I feel like closing my eyes and uh, interceding, also known as sleeping. They're debating who is better, who is better. And this is the, these are the games we play in our congregations. Who is a better elder, who is a better preacher, who is a better chairperson. But God's answer, different leaders have different callings and different gifts, but God causes the growth. So wrong models of ministry focus on the quantity rather than the quality, but God's wisdom is that we spend some time on quality rather than quantity. Second example, in the season of Easter that we still are in, I was thinking of the disciples with Jesus, and they are asking, having spent time with Jesus, they are still learning, and they're asking Jesus, who is the greatest disciple? And Jesus teaches them a lesson, not by writing on the blackboard or showing a PowerPoint slide, but giving them a practical lesson. On that Monday Thursday, which is set up in the context of the Lord's Supper, we find him with his disciples getting down on his knees, laying down his clothes, putting a towel around his waist, and taking these dirty feet of the disciples. Remember that context? They are likely not walking with our nice black, brown, and colorful shoes, like the pink ones that the choir was singing with. But they have sandals. Their feet are dusty. Their feet are probably cracked. Maybe smelly, I don't know. But Jesus is still getting down to his knees. The Lord of all creation, taking the role of a slave, which is the context in which we find ourselves, taking the position of a slave to serve his people, to lay down his clothes for his people. 
as an example of how he will lay down his life for his people. Taking their smelly, cracky, uh, dirty lives and washing them clean, serving sinners. Jesus, again, showing us that the model of service is a focus on quality as much as it is quantity. Brothers and sisters, service is not about position. Service is about influence, godly influence. Service is pouring our lives out so that the lives of others can be put back together. Service is to give to others without expecting anything in return. This is the way of Jesus. And this is the model we find in both the life of Joshua and the life of Jesus. Both are called to take the people to the promised land. Both undergo a period of preparation or a period of training before they are commissioned, so to speak. Both are commissioned. We find that Joshua is commissioned. We find Jesus also being commissioned by God. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Both are called to serve the audience of one. Both also run their race faithfully. If we look at their lives, we find here models for us. How should we serve? Joshua and Jesus will give us a way forward. But lastly, brothers and sisters, not just the motivation for our service, the models of service, but finally, the methods of our service. Now, we have been spending some time in the book of Joshua looking at Moses the mentor and Joshua the mentee. And it is interesting to note that, that these two biblical characters had different uh, offices. Moses, if we may, we could say he had a prophetic office. A prophetic office, not the prophetic that we know as African Christians, but a prophet in the sense that he brought the word of God to the people of God. At Mount Sinai, he is the one, the mediator of the law of God in the Old Testament, just as Jesus is. Joshua, we have learned, is a military leader, and he has been called to take the people of Israel to the promised land. So these are different leaders with two different callings. And yet there is something that they are always coming back to, the word of God. And so Joshua, time and again, God is coming and reminding him, do not be afraid. Do not depart from the law of God, either to the left or to the right. Moses, of course, himself gives us the word of God. So the word of God is always consistent. It is always the same. It will never change. But the methods of ministry may change, depending on the season that we find ourselves in. Different seasons call for different strategies or different methods. So as a Presbyterian Church of East Africa, brothers and sisters, what season are we in? What season do you think as a church we are in? And what strategies do we need? Bearing in mind the word of God is constant and it will always be at the center. But what strategies do we need for our season? In the post-COVID context of the church, we have been challenged because previously we had a model of the church I would call it the gathered church model where we were expecting people to come to the congregation. And we are, of course, encouraged when our people do come to the congregation. But it seems as if what COVID did was to change our thinking a little bit to think about, yes, the gathered model of church, but also the scattered model of church. After all, Jesus has called us not to stay, <laughs> but to go. And maybe God is teaching us or reminding us that yes, we do well to ensure that when we gather, we are growing and fellowshipping together and preaching the word of God, etc. But again, we are called to go to our people where they are. That is also ministry. I was privileged this year to be invited to contribute to what is called the State of the Great Commission Report. It will be launched uh, at the Lausanne Congress that is happening in Seoul, South Korea at the end of the year, and that is a report that brings together Christians from various traditions to think about where we are as far as the Great Commission is concerned. But the PCA question for me is a question of tradition 
versus ministry innovation. Tradition versus ministry innovation. What will be the balance? If we do tradition for tradition's sake, we sacrifice people. We may sacrifice ministry. We may sacrifice mission. Again, if we are always thinking about innovation in innovation, we may drift away from the path that has been set for us, which is a good path, a good heritage, a good tradition. So how do we balance the two so that we have a tradition that is enlivened by ministry and by ministry innovation? And we have ministry innovation that does not drive us away in the path of Shakahola, for instance. Tradition versus ministry in innovation. How can we serve the needs of our time? If I think of the PCA, I think this church is actually a church of innovation. Think of 1922, the girls movement, Keamakiago, which was the precursor of the Women's Guild. And they actually began this movement to deal or to wrestle with retrogressive gender issues and gender cultural practices. And the reality of this girls' movement or the women's guild was actually an innovation in the culture, an innovation in the society, a political innovation, and even, we could argue, a theological innovation because it brought to the center the dignity of our daughters and our sisters and our mothers. Of course, in 76, the GA then passed the ordination of women premised on the truth that a bird can only fly if it has two wings. PCA had already, had already set here an innovative way of engaging matters gender a long time ago, and churches still wrestle with it, but PCA was already setting a precedence. The, our father in God, again, we remi remember him, uh, the late rever very reverend Dr. George Wanjawa. I read somewhere that when he came here, moderator, you said this was a Scottish Presbyterian church, and what in terms of pastoral, pastoral care, I, I learned that our father in God actually was the one who took, began taking communion to the old people who would not come to the congregation. Innovation in ministry. But then again, we have just been giving communion in homes and I'm wondering, what would innovation look like for us? Because now that has become a, a tradition. How do we balance tradition and ministry, ministry innovation? There are three contemporary questions or challenges that I've, I have heard time and again in the proceedings being brought up. And these are contemporary issues that require wise, theological, biblical, pastoral, and practical models of engagement. For these three things, we are clear on the biblical position, but we still need to discern, meet together, and discuss proper pastoral models for engagement. Sexuality, number one. We know the biblical position. I think that is clear. That in these immoral practices, God is not pleased, and there are many passages that speak to that effect. But as those caught up in this scene, as our members are caught up in other, many other scenes, how could we offer pastoral care to those who are caught up in this lifestyle? How do we engage? The biblical position is clear, the theological stance is clear, and that may come up to the, uh, to the PP at some point, if it passes. But then how do we then do pastoral care, pastoral ministry to those members in our congregation who may be in this space? Resurgence of traditional religious practices. Again, I am aware of the debates, but I had a question raised. How then do we offer pastoral ministry to men who may have given these quotes or young people being driven away uh, to, fall, to go back to their roots? What would, what would be the mode of engagement? Again, the biblical and theological perspective would be clear, but how do we do pastoral ministry to them? Mental health. Yes, we are clear on this issue perhaps, but how would this show up in our pastoral prayers? So we usually have a tradition of calling the children and young people to the front. And sometimes I think the way we pray for youth is like they are 
in a different category. Lord, save them from drugs and alcohol. As if all was there, they are not, they don't need saving from drug and alcohol. Save them from sexuality, as if we do not have adultery among the adults in our congregations. Save them from this. It's a very negative. And I was wondering, what might it mean to slightly tweak our prayers? To say, Lord, we are grateful you have given us these young people in our congregations. Oh, Lord, thank you for their gifts. Thank you for their potential, for their strengths. Thank you for their commitment. Continue to strengthen them. Continue to use them. What would that communicate in the lives of young people? I think it may communicate something different. Preaching and counseling in a way that, yes, challenges us with the truth, but still brings us close, heals us, gives us hope, restores us, renews us, refreshes us. So, yes, we have the psychologists in our congregations and we will work with them, but when it comes to this issue of mental health, how do we do our pastoral ministry? How do we, as elders, shepherd our people who may be going through this? These, I think, would be three issues that I would raise to the floor. I don't have quick answers. Sometimes we want quick answers. But I think you, as a leader in the church, where you are placed, you are in what I would call the laboratory of ministry. There, as you are with the people, God has given you these people. God has given you insight, the word of God. God has given you his spirit. And that is the space to discern. It is not the space to just do things. This is the way we are used to doing things. But it is to discern what are the needs of the people and how can we engage with them. And I will say that this is not just a challenge of the church. I think for us who are doing theological education, for a long time the theology has been detached from the church. And the best of theology will always be in service to the church of God, to the mission, to the mission of God. And so these are the questions we are also wrestling with. How will we offer our people? How will we train our people in a way that is relevant for our context? You can be assured if you go to the, our university prayer or you come to our other university, St. Paul's, we will be doing some short courses in the course of the year. And of course, in consultation with the GEO office, we would like to work with the church to see how do we offer continuous training for you, church leaders who are at the forefront of ministry. In the professional world, they talk of CPD, continuous professional development. And people cannot progress in the company unless they are undergoing continuous training. I think we need such a principle also in the church, Bonaji. If I was able to contribute to the assembly, maybe that would have been my proposal. Continuous professional development for ministers and that the church should support them so that they are strengthened and equipped to do this work of ministry, this important, critical work of ministry. Our elders, uh, our lay training, continuing to do that uh, and continue to do that even better and our other institutions. So I don't have easy answers for the methods of ministry. I think perhaps when we come back uh, for the 25th General Assembly, we can be able to say this is what we tried and this is what worked in terms of service. We are a laboratory of God. Let me move to the end of our time together by saying that we have spent time looking at Joshua. Joshua has offered to us a faithful example of ministry, a faithful example of service. And so we take the example of Joshua seriously because he was a type of Christ in the Old Testament who led the people to the promised land. But brothers and sisters, we will do well to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the better Joshua, the better Joshua who will lead us to our eternal promised land, our eternal promised home, where there will be no more fear of title deed brokers. No more fear, no more fear of loans. <laughs> Presby uh, presbytery officials, no more fear of cess. Kenyans, no more fear of taxes. <laughs> no more tears, no more pain. No more uncertainties in our lives. No more mammon to tempt us. But only endless joy as we experience 
the true and divine settlement that we have always been longing for. But before that time, brother, brothers and sisters, we do have work to do. We do have work to do. And a crown awaits us who will serve faithfully. A crown like the one our Father in God has likely received and who offers us an example in this GA. The work is clearly set for us. The word of God will remind us well in the next three years. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, brothers and sisters, always be sober-minded and you are suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This is the promise, brothers and sisters. Go out and serve in faithfulness and sincerity in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful for how you have spoken to us. We thank you for your word, which is life for us, which is a lamp to our feet. We are grateful for how you have challenged us and how you have equally encouraged us. You have reminded us, Lord, of what really matters in our service. And in these three years, Lord, we pray that your grace would be sufficient for each and every service that we shall offer. Lord, we confess for some of us that our service has been half-hearted. Our service has been tempted and focused on mammon, on, on, on things rather than on you and on the people you have called us to serve. Lord, because you invite us to come to the throne of grace and mercy to find help in our time of need. We do come once again to your throne. We know that there are sufficient bucketfuls of graces. There is sufficient mercy for us who serve you, whom you have called to serve you in different ways. Lord, and we pray that you would forgive us and Lord, cause our hearts to turn back towards you and to offer you the service that you deserve. You who is the God of promise the God who knows us and is concerned for us. Some of us, we may be smiling, Lord, we may be having courageous faces, but Lord, we are serving in difficult times, in challenging times. We are serving not knowing what lies ahead of us. We are serving with a huge burden, huge debts, huge deficits in various ways. Oh Lord, you see the service that these your brothers and sisters have been offered in this faithful service. You see them who may not be shouting on social media, shouting everywhere, but they are silently and faithfully serving you. Lord, remember them. Lord, grant them your strength. Grant them your wisdom. Refresh them, master, you who has called them. Cause them to look to you who is the one who has called them and cause them to see that their strength lies in you and not in themselves or their circumstances. You are a faithful God. You have given us a promise of what lies ahead for, of us. Continue, Lord, to remind us of the proper motivation for ministry, the model for ministry, and the methods. Give us creativity, give us insight, give us discernment as we serve for the advance of the gospel 
and the expansion of the kingdom. This we pray, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Thank you, Dr. Kevin, the moderator, our fathers in God, commissioners and delegates. After such a presentation for three days, I am not very sure that I know how to deal ahead such um, a presentation. But three questions are in our bodies now. They are in our minds. Who are you serving? Who are you serving with? And how are you serving? But it aside, I would want to seek you dungeons that we have like 10 minutes and do a response <clears throat> before we could go to the formal sessions. And we will, after we do maybe some reflections, we would want the moderator to also make a, a comment and then we will have Dr. Hendo Adifuri to, on behalf of this General Assembly to pass a vote of thanks to our speaker. So maybe this side we can have one uh, feedback. How has it been and what are we taking home? What are we telling ourselves? And then from this side, we can have another one. Pandehi, we want to react. Yes, um, Reverend Gere wants to do a reaction. And then from this side, now we will get a lady. Thank you. DSG and my fellow commissioners, at any given time, always the Lord provides the word of the moment and the way to go. It's calling upon us for the personal declaration. Like Joshua, in the midst of all that he was going through, he had all the ability to talk about on, on his behalf and the other significant persons in his life. And I think now that we are serving in the church, considering Bona DSG and the federal commissioners here, although the Lord has been telling us to consider our ways, and now the issue of the service is coming. We are in an era of the service delivery. So much from the speaker is not about the position, but the influence that uh, you are creating where you are at that particular time. There is a mismatch when we want to be like any other. And here the Lord God is calling upon us as individuals as the commissioners of the 24th General Assembly, we are parting our ways after this congregation. And I think uh, our moderator to have thought of coming up with this kind of a theme is uh, so much about the personal undertaking and endeavor that we are being called upon. We are many, like even the 12 that were called, had different occupation, but they impacted the church because we are their byproduct. We have all the manner of the professionals that we have in our church. And the big, big question is that, how, why are we not making the impact that is needed with all that we have? That's why we are coming in, in, a, in, a, in a certain manner that this is the message to carry with us. Because service starts even from the Jerusalem. We are also men and women elected in the position in the church. We are also in the corporate. The Lord is calling upon us to reflect. And we really thank God for Dr. Kevin. The way he has put it and the, the, the mastery of the contents. 
we are much better than we came. And it's a personal undertaking, personal influence that will matter by the end of the day. We are not serving our own. We are not serving one another. We are serving the almighty even as we serve the humanity. I rest my case. Wow, thank you, thank you so much uh, Reverend Ngere. Service delivery, service beyond the four walls of our churches. From this side, a lady and most probably an elder. Yes, Thank you, Daktari, for that uh, message. Uh, we started with Joshua 24, and it had a choice. And the last part of that chapter 24 is actually the choice, which the theme we got for the 24th General Assembly, that we will serve the Lord. And therefore, we started with a choice, and all what we have gotten for the three days was actually to make a choice. And that choice is deliberate. Who shall we serve? But A of the Joshua 24, verse 15, has two areas, the idols and the living God. And we did make a choice with the guidance of the moderator of the 24th General Assembly. Right now, what we have gotten for the three days is who we shall serve with. We could not overemphasize from Daktari the use of other people, particularly the youth and the young. Because if we don't take care when the tree is growing, we shall not be able to harness whatever is in our capabilities in our church. We cannot overemphasize getting innovation on the handling of the youth. And even in other areas, I remember the women ministry, they indicated how the women are moving from one area to another looking for prayers. So what is it that we need innovation in order to move and get our women back to the Presbyterian Church of East Africa to get what they need? we cannot overemphasize the innovation. And who shall we, the last question was, how shall we serve? It was very, very clear, the service and the motivation. Because as I conclude, our God is a rewarder. There's a reward system for each and every minister in this GA and every elder who the commissioners who are here as elders and the ones we have left at home. May we make that choice. May God bless you. Wow, thank you so very much. Making a deliberate choice and being innovative. Before I invite the monitor, I remember back in 1999, in his uh, attempt of the late Reverend Kanya's efforts of mentorship, we had a Human's Guild member who died. And when we were going for the burial, he told me, you know, I have been doing a lot of burials. I have buried, I have buried. Today I don't have a sermon. You are the one to preach. And therefore, a very young man from high school I didn't know how to do a sermon when in our rural traditional area, a woman's killed, members died. And the minister calls a young man to preach in that service. And when I finished preaching and he came to do his comment, he held his cassock and said, what I have seen in that young man, I see him one day in such a cassock. I don't think it is because I had preached well, but he wanted to build me. And that one has impacted me to today. And therefore, as I invite the moderator when we go back there, seeing that the moderator was led by God to identify for this general assembly a young person 
to come and be the facilitator of Bible study during a general assembly. As our last speaker said, we must make deliberate choice, we must be innovative, we must look for ways and means innovatively to give young people more space in our programs and the ingenuity within the youth will surprise us. Moderator, as we head this fellowship, because it has like, been a fellowship, we'd want to hear your comment and then we'll be having Dr. Furi to come and to put off thanks on behalf of the assembly. Moderator. Thank you. Good morning. Praise be to God. I need not say much because we have had uh, a very inspired speaker for the past three days. I share his wish that we should have had a fourth day. But you people never proposed a resolution. Therefore, we edit today. But we go home knowing that our church is very rich. It has young people in it. Much as we need to mentor and bring more. But we are not empty-hearted. If what Dr. Murezi has presented is anything to go by, we are not poor. We are rich. We just need to look aloud and has been said, see how we can mentor the young people. And now that we are in the spirit, we are in the period of mourning our church father, who is remembered mainly one for mentorship, this is something we must take home with us, mentorship. We have said it severally that our past moderator had lots of concern for young people. He thought about the students in the university and the youth here in the church, and this is how this building came up. He didn't start with the building the way sometimes we do, thinking about the construction and so on. He thought about the young people first because they were already here. He had mobilized and they were fellowshipping here. Then he wondered where they would meet. Therefore, in that spirit of our late church father, we also need to think about our young people, empower them because no matter how much we, don't, we, we deny, gradually we are exiting with every passing day. You and me are exiting and therefore the church will need these people more than it will need us. So I guess to Mepata Maokoto <laughs> that was the word for yesterday from TZ <laughs> and for sure I have also enjoyed and um, you know there is sometimes you I haven't heard Dr. Murezi teach or preach. Therefore, I was taking a risk. But I'm glad I'm not disappointed. He has a very good name at St. Paul's University. The faculty there, the leadership there speak very well of him. And uh, he makes us happy as Presbyterians that we have one of us who is at that university, which is an ecumenical university, where there is some, you know, silent uh, competition. There is competition there, much as it's not uh, declared, but of course every denomination would want to shine in that institution. There, there, there are no, there's no, it's not a contest, but it's there. So when you hear that your own is doing very well, you are very happy. So uh, Dr. Mulevi, may God take good care of you and protect you. I hope we can, I don't know what uh, time uh, uh, DSG will say a prayer for, for him. Uh, yes, after the vote of th thanks, we could do a prayer for him, even as we pray for ourselves. And take home the message of Joshua, as it has been well elucidated by uh, Mwarim here, of who we, we, sh we serve, who we are serving with, and how we should serve. Because, as I said, this message is an answer to what we have been doing in the 23rd General Assembly. Because having considered our ways, it's
it's like we were taking a shower. It's like, you know, we were preparing ourselves by considering our ways. Now that we have considered our ways, although I said we are not sure how much you and me have considered there, but we assume after three years that we have considered our ways. Then we cannot just be that prepared and not then go to the next level of serving the Lord. Having considered our ways, we are now confident in saying we will serve the Lord. So thank you very much once again, Daktari, for that beautiful presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Just in the same spirit, again, we want to appreciate our moderator for taking this risk that has really paid off in a big way. Let's appreciate our moderator for the big risk. And oftentimes when you are given a chance to say a vote of thanks, most people would say, mine is a simple task. But it's not so simple this morning. <laughs> Because what we have gotten from our colleague, one of us, is really enriching. And I believe that all of us as congregations, if nothing else, um, is on our minds, at least one thing is that we give our young people platforms. The same way our moderator has taken a risk to give a young theologian this highest platform of our denomination, let us go to our congregations and continue with the risk, trusting that the same grace will also work. That we shall be amazed at what our young people are able to do when we give them high platforms. I want to appreciate very much uh, Dr. Kevin. And as I was listening, you know, sometimes when you hear somebody from the academy, you often wonder whether they'll be able to connect, you know, at a ground level. There's a new party in town, Qua Ground. What is it called? Qua Ground. So sometimes you hear somebody from the academy and you think they'll be very lofty and you might have to struggle to understand but you did it so well. You bridged the academy with the ground, and we all understood you. Thank you so much for that. There are so many perspectives that we have gotten right from the three questions that you helped us navigate. We also appreciate the language that you've given us. Sometimes you, your mind is opened by hearing a different language, for instance, that as ministers, as elders, that we are on the laboratory of ministry. Did you hear that? The biblical position is clear, but the method, we are in the laboratory of ministry. I remember that. So you gave us the language and gave us a license to imagine ministry in the context of the biblical truths. Thank you for perspectives. Thank you also for wrestling with these texts. It's very clear you've labored for hours to put that together. You've wrestled. Sometimes you would put questions up in the air. I would wonder, now you're putting Joshua on one hand. Oh, he is, you know, come man after my own, you know, I and my, I and my family will serve the Lord. Then on the other hand, you say, there arose another generation that did not serve the Lord. I did not, and I was wondering, how will you reconcile this? But you left it up in the air. You never reconciled it for us. And you told us at least something, what's clear, something was wrong. How do we set things right? Thank you for wrestling with the text. And you did it always in a three-part fashion. And so, as I end this appreciation, 
I'll try and use that three-part method. And you also made them rhyme, like motivation, you know, method. There was a rhyme to it. So allow me to try, as I end, a rhyme of appreciation. Thank you, Dr. Kevin Moravi, for your availability. Thank you for your generosity. And thank you for your intensity. Amen. And I would ask that we take that clap a little higher. Let's give this gentleman our own, a standing ovation, a standing ovation as we clap. A standing ovation clap goes a little more. All to the glory of God. Amen. Thank you. Wow, well, thank you, Dr. Furi. Now we invite the monitor to say a prayer to Dr. Kelvin. Monitor. As he kneels here, he's a young man. He will not need any cushion. for your care and your protection upon him. We thank you for his availability and his resourcefulness. And that he agreed, Lord, without declining or objecting. And he could have said, no, that's not my praise. That's a general assembly. I do not have what it takes. But he accepted the challenge because he knew you would be with him. And Lord, you have not disappointed him. We are glad that Lord is working at St. Paul's University, one of our great universities. And Lord, he is impacting on the young people. We want Lord to present him to you, remembering Lord that he has a family, that you take care of his family, there will be harmony and tranquility in that family. And you give him favor at St. Paul's University, and even his membership here at UCS and Andrews. And Lord, when we require him some other time that he will also be available, not necessarily to do what he has done, but do something else. We also pray, as we pray for him, for young people in the church, that Lord, he will be of use. And for us who are a bit elderly, help us, Lord, to identify young people. They may be lacking, they may be weak, but we have a role we can play to make them better. We look forward even for many girls, who will come into the ministry and serve because this ministry is for men and women because you created them in your image and likeness. Thank you, Lord. Even as he parts, he does other things in the days ahead. Be with him and be with us. And the message that he has conveyed to us, we pray that we are going to apply it so that we are not just hearers but doers of your word. Our prayer of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 May God bless you and keep you. May God lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. That peace that goes beyond human understanding. Keep your hearts, your minds, your bodies in love for Jesus Christ. The blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Okay, thank you so very much. Uh, we will not leave. We will ask our priest team to give us some few numbers, and then we will just come right away. Thank you. Priest team, where are you? If, if they are not around the choir, oh, yeah, the priest team is already in. Yeah, the priest team is, ne is in. Give us some few uh, oh. hymns. We will come right away.
So 
Moderator. Moderator, we would uh, wish to start this session uh, by inviting the worship team so that they can start, at we start us with a word of prayer. Welcome. Worship. Worship. Welcome. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for gathering us. And before we scatter, for the church is about gathering and yet receiving your church to go, we have the agenda remaining for the day and aligned and we pray for strength and even the light response as now the moderator, the SG, the DSG, the honorary treasurer, and all delegates and commissioners continue to engage. Be with us as we continue to focus in the call to service. For greatness is not just in any position, but greatly in serving you. Heal us and bless us and give us the calmness of our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, moderator, uh, before we continue with uh, the reports of the various committees, uh, uh, I would request, uh, moderator, that we first uh, get uh, a report from the various um, uh, committees charged with uh, the moderator's uh, report, uh, the message to the congregation, place, and the restoration of thanks. Thank you. In that order that is proposed, the moderator's report, resolution committee, take the podium. Next will be mes message to congregations, and then place release. 